now. So today we're going to start looking at the statistics here. Now, this is more about an introduction to statistics in that we don't really do any statistics calculations in this chapter. This chapter is mainly concepts and definitions. Now, one thing I will tell you about my exam, I do not expect for you to recite definitions on an exam. I do expect for you to have a general idea of what the, the terms mean. And that is this chapter, basically. Um, the next chapter describing data, we, we actually do some statistical stuff. But here, it's really just an introduction to terms. All right. So let's start with our first term is a population. Population of study is the group the collected data is intended to describe. So I may want to try to find some data about students at UWF. So my population would be all the students at UWF. Now the reality is typically we take, well, I'll wait till we get to that. So a newspaper website contains a poll asking people their opinion on a recent news article. What is the population? Who are they trying to find information about? No, we're talking about different, a newspaper website. Yeah, well, we'll go to read the paper. The newspaper, bless you. On the website. Okay. That makes sense. Because not everybody, not everybody that reads the or participate, not everybody that reads the paper is necessarily going to participate in the poll. So next we have something called parameters. Parameters are values, say the average or percentage that is calculated using all the data from the population. So parameter is population. Go ahead, hit it now. So the next term you've probably heard of is the census. A census is a survey of the entire population. I'm sorry. Again, you won't need to write down definitions on an exam, and all of this is available to you in Canvas. Now we get to the stuff that we're more interested in a sample. A sample is a smaller subset of an entire population, ideally, one that is fairly representative of the whole population. So getting back to what I was saying before, if I wanted to find out things about UWF students, I might take a sample of students like you in this classroom or people in all my classes. That would be a sample, a smaller group of the entire population. So a statistic is a value, an average or a percentage calculated using data from a sample. So population, we have parameters. Samples, we have statistics. Parameters and statistics are essentially the same thing. It's just the parameters for the whole population, which we probably won't use ever. And the statistics is for a sample, a smaller group. So here we have a researcher wanted to know about citizens or how citizens of Pensacola felt about a voter initiative. To study this, she goes to Cordova Mall and randomly selects 500 shoppers and asks them their opinion. 60% indicate they are supportive of the initiative. What is the sample and population? And is the 60% value a parameter or a statistic? 
So what is the sample? I'm sorry? The 500 people, 500 shoppers? Surveyed? No, it's the people that were actually surveyed. So what's the population? How about, I want to know how citizens of Pensacola, citizens of Pensacola, that's the population. I'm trying to determine what the people of Pensacola think. We're asking 500 people in the mall, which is probably not a good, actually good sample, but that's what they chose. And then what is this 60%? Is it a parameter or a statistic? Well, where did it come from? It's a statistic because it's the percent of the people we surveyed, which was a sample. So percentage of the sample is a statistic. Percentage of the population is a parameter. Any questions so far? Yep. Sample of the 500 shoppers we surveyed, the population is the citizens of Pensacola, and the statistic, 60% is a st statistic. Say that three times fast. I'm sorry? And now we look at two different types of data. Qualitative data are pieces of information that allow us to classify objects under investigation into various categories. Quantitative data are responses that are numerical in nature and with which we can perform meaningful arithmetic calculation. This part is very important in that definition. So we might conduct a survey to determine the name of the favorite movie that each person in, in a math class saw in a movie theater. Is this information qualitative or quantitative? We're being given a bunch of movie names. Qualitative, very good. I can't divide Raiders by the Lost Ark by Star Wars. So it has to be qualitative. The easiest way to think about it is quantitative, quantity, quantity, a number. The survey asks the number of movies you've seen in a movie theater in the past 12 months. Is this information qualitative or quantitative? Quantitative, right? Because I can ask everybody in here, how many movies you've seen in the last year? Then I can take those numbers and add them up or divide and find the average number of movies you saw. So it is quantitative. Now here's a tricky one. Suppose we gather respondent zip codes in a survey to track their geographical location. Is this information qualitative or quantitative? Quantitative or qualitative? Yes, zip code. Who agrees? Qualitative? Anybody think quantitative? Okay, can I find the average zip code? And would it have any meaning if I did? Remember, I pointed out that's what you have to remember about quantitative. You have to be able to calculate something with it. Now, I guess we could calculate an average zip code, but it wouldn't mean anything. So if that wasn't bad enough, there comes this one. A survey about a restaurant you most recently ate at includes the question, how would you rate your experience with these possible answers? One, it was awful. Two, it was just okay. Three, I liked it. Four, it was great. Five, best meal ever. 
Is this information qualitative or quantitative? Sorry? I don't believe so. Maybe you were just dreaming. So who says quantitative? Who says qualitative? You're all right. Just think about it. It's qualitative if we use this part, right? And it's quantitative if we use that part. We can calculate the average rating one to five, but we can't calculate the average. What's the average between it was awful and it was just okay? Sort of kind of awfully okay or something like that. So this one is technically both, depending on how you look at it. Any questions on quantitative and qualitative? Again, quantitative, you think numbers, but you also have to keep in mind that you have to be able to calculate something like an average. Yes? So every time it's done with words? Typically, words are going to be qualitative. Occasionally, numbers will like zip code ones. Or, yeah, we could find the average, but it wouldn't have any meaning. But yes, for the most part, words is qualitative, numbers is quantitative, as long as they mean something. So, to some more definitions. A sampling bias occurs when every member of the population doesn't have equal likelihood of being in the sample. I go back to my students of UWF. As I said, I could take a sample of the entire population by surveying you in this class. But do you think this classroom represents a is a good representation of all students at UWF? Let me ask this question another way. How many of you are not freshmen? Okay, so if you look, that's less than half. So that means more than half of you are freshmen, which would skew my data to a younger group. And some of you are significantly older than others, have significantly different attitudes about some things in life. So would it really, it's hard to tell. I would consider it not being a good sample because it just, it, it's a sample and it's a workable sample, but I just don't look at it as a very good sample. Which brings us to simple random sample. A random sample is one in which each member of the population has an equal probability of being chosen. A simple random sample is one in which every member of the population and any group of members has an equal probability of being chosen. So if we could somehow identify all likely voters in the country, put each of their names in a piece of paper, on a piece of paper and toss the slips into a very large hat and draw out 10,000 slips out of the hat, we would have a simple random sample. We randomly pulled 10,000 people, 10,000 names out of the hat that had everybody's name in it. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Sampling variability, the natural variation of sample is called sampling variability. This is unavoidable and expected in random sampling. In most cases, is not an issue. Okay, so now we're going to look at different ways to do sampling. First one is stratified sampling. In stratified sampling, population is divided into a number of subgroups or strata. 
Random samples are then taken from each subgroup, subgroup with sample sizes proportional to the size of the subgroup in the population. So let's see. Told you this is all definition. Suppose a particular state that previous data indicated that the electorate was comprised of 39% Democrats, 37% Republicans, and 24% independents. In a sample of 1,000 people, they would then expect to get 390 Democrats, 370 Republicans, and 240 independents. 39, 37, and 24% of 1,000. To accomplish this, they could randomly select 390 people from those voters known to be Democrats. So they're randomly selecting them once they've determined they're all Democrats. 370 that are known to be Republicans and 240 with no party affiliation. This is stratified sampling. The strata in this case is Democrat, Republican, Independent. 39% are Democrats, so I need 39% of my thousand to be Democrats. So I take 390 out of the thousand or of the Democrats and so forth. That makes sense. Now this leads us to quota sampling. It's a variation of stratified sampling, wherein samples are collected in each subgroup until the desired quota is met. So using the information from the previous example, suppose the pollsters call people at random. But once they have met their quota of 390 Democrats, they only gather, data, gather people who do not identify themselves as Democrats. This is an example of quota sampling. So we know 39% of the population is Democrat. We want to sample 1,000 people. So we know we need 390 Democrats. So I'm going through the phone book, picking, picking people randomly, calling them, asking their party affiliation, and then surveying them. Once I hit my 390th Democrat that has agreed to the survey and taken it, if I call the next person, they identify as Democrat. Well, I've met my quota, so I say, thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day. Go to the next person. I would not take any more Democrats once I hit 390. That's what we're talking about, quota. We determine how many we need. I need 390 Democrats, so I keep calling until I get that. Once I get 390 Democrats, I just look for Republicans and Independents. That makes sense. Cluster sampling. In cluster sampling, the population is divided into subgroups or clusters, and a set of subgroups are collected, are selected to be in the sample. So, unlike before, where we randomly pick people out of this out of the strata, here we're picking people out of subgroups. Or actually, we're picking the subgroups themselves. So I randomly put everybody in like quadrants, and then I randomly pick quadrants to choose. Again, some of these methods are better than others. Systematic sampling. Systematic sampling, every nth member of the population is selected to be in the sample. To select a sample using systematic sampling, a pollster, pollster calls every 100th name in the phone book. Sounds like a good idea, right? Systematic sampling is not as random as a simple random sample. If your name is Albert Aardvark and your sister Alexis Aardvark is right after you in the phone book, there's no way you could both end up in the sample. So it's not a good sampling method in this particular way, especially. But it could yield, it could, but it's not quite right. That brings us to convenient sampling and voluntary sampling. Convenient sampling is samples chosen by selecting whoever is convenient. 
It's kind of like our newspaper, our, our survey in the mall. We're just asking people to walk by. Awfully convenient. Or if I want to survey this class, maybe I just ask, survey those of you in the front row because I can't walk that far. That's convenient to me, right? And voluntary response sampling is, is allowing a sample to volunteer. You see this a lot when you do online shopping. After you finish your transaction, they always ask, do you want to do a survey on how your experience was? That would be voluntary. You don't have to do it. You can do it. It's your choice. So let's look at these examples here. A pollster stands on a street corner and interviews the first 100 people who agreed to speak to him. Is this a convenient sample? I would think so. The first 100 people to walk by me. I just stand it. Heck, I'd pick up, pull up a chair and sit there. A website has a survey asking readers to give their opinion on a tax proposal. This is a self-selected sample or voluntary response sample in which respondents volunteer to participate. Question? Now we get to the biggie with samples. Talking about sources of bias or sampling bias. When the sample is not representative of the population, there's voluntary response bias, the sampling bias that often occurs when the sample is volunteers. There's self-interest study, bias that can occur when the researchers have an interest in the outcome. You know, like scientists hired by a cigarette company to find out if cigarettes are harmful to your health. There's response bias when the responder gives inaccurate responses for any reason. There's perceived lack of anonymity when the responder fears given an honest answer might negatively affect them. There's loaded questions. When the question wording influences the responses and there's non-response bias when people refuse to participate in the study can influence the validity of the outcome. So let's see if we can figure this out. Consider a recent study which found that chewing gum may raise math grades in teenagers. Did you know that? A survey that found it. This study was conducted by the Wrigley Science Institute, a branch of Wrigley Chewing Gum Company. This would be an example of a self-interest study, right? One in which the researchers have a vested interest in the outcome of the study. Now, this does not necessarily ensure that the study was biased. It certainly suggests that it would be subject that we should subject the study to extra scrutiny. All right. If Wrigley hires you, you're most likely going to kind of lean towards their, their look, their thoughts. The survey asked people, when was the last time you visited your doctor? This might suffer from response bias, since many people might not remember exactly when they last saw a doctor and give inaccurate responses. The survey asked participants a question about their interaction with members of other races. Here, a lack of anonymity could influence the outcome. The respondent might not want to be perceived as a racist, even if they are, and give an untruthful answer. So, again, makes it almost impossible to do a dang survey. So many ways that it can be skewed. An employer puts out a survey asking their employees if they have a drug abuse problem and need treatment help. Here, answering truthfully might have consequences. Responses might not be accurate if the employees do not feel the responses are anonymous or fear retribution from their employer. A survey asks, do you support funding research of alternative energy sources to reduce our reliance on high polluting fossil fuels? This would be an example of a loaded or leading question. 
The wording leads the respondent towards an answer. Because nobody wants to use high polluting fossil fuels. Pollution is terrible. And tell Yeah, response by, because they might not remember, or they might not want you to know. The telephone poll asked the question, do you often have time to relax and read a book? And 50% of the population called refused to answer the survey. It is unlikely that the results will be representative of the entire population. This is an example of non-response bias introduced by people Refusing to participate in a study or dropping out of an experiment. When people refuse to participate, we can no longer be certain that our sample is representative of the population. A lot of biases. I don't know if I mentioned this last week. The exams in this class are based on the homework. So most of what we just went over is not something that you will be tested on. So I think this will probably be a good point to call it a day. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Turn it in online, there should be a drop box. It is due the Sunday after the exam, which I believe is what, the 19th for us? I change it to the 19th or something. Yeah, Sunday after the exam. Are we leaving already? Didn't we not do something yet? Are you here? All right. Ever since I had cataract surgery, I cannot see my cursor. Let's start here. And let's stop recording.